So a couple of elements here that, that are significant. First off, it was not done at the beginning of the concert or in the middle of it. It was, it was done when folks were leaving. And so often For maximum carnage, as Theresa May said. And what really, what they're doing is they're changing the tempo, which means they did some pre-operational surveillance. They saw what happened in, this, in, the, in these types of arena, 20,000 people there. And then they used a device that had basically a shrapnel effect. That's where they, they used the bolts and the ball bearings. So they went to do absolute carnage. What, we, what you try to do in any type of arena is, well, first of all, you should try to detect any type of device if you can. And that is best done, I think, is you can do magnetometers. But bomb dogs play a very large role in this. We were talking yeah. about that with uh, Ed, uh, Ed Davis last hour, in fact. And, and so, the, again, the question is, what happens in, in, you know, how do you protect every single venue at every time? They chose this venue, so largest in Manchester, but it's not typically, you know, like the center of London, that type of exposure. So they're trying to spread their message of fear, and that's what makes this such a challenge, is how do you sustain and, and spread all the security? And Steve is actually the one who brought up the use of... of explosive sniffing dogs okay. and in even having the presence of dogs out there right. it's a, it does act as a deterrent it but sure Steve, go ahead. Mike I'm very curious to see how they got the 23 year old yeah. I mean do you think there is a possibility that there's a cell out there maybe the videos that they looked at what's your what's your uh, 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 educated guess on how they got that 23 year old well, so you know better than anybody else that this type of device is not made in, you know cooked up in a in a, uh, in a garage by a lone wolf it takes you, you got to have some experience right. you got to have know-how to be able to put something like this together which indicates that the individual had support Right. And so a part of a cell. And so the question is, how do they get into the city? Were they there for a while? You know, as we recall back in 2005 when they had the airline bomb plot, it came from the same area. So there is an indication that perhaps there are communities here that have some type of, of affinity right. to, to um, al-Qaeda at that point in time and now ISIS. Right. And we're going to see what the kind of radicalization is. But again, you know better than anybody else that that's flipped. And and they so that was the point I believe Colonel Schaefer made earlier. There had to be someone else involved, and now they have a 23-year-old, right. right. and who knows where that's going to lead. I, I want to ask you both. The, the president is in Israel right now. Israel has been dealing with this kind of yeah. terror for, for decades. What have law yeah, he's enforcement... leaving from. He'll be leaving from Ben Gurion Airport at, uh, at about 8:45, 9 o'clock. And right. Ben Gurion has arguably the best security in the world. Right. So what 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 is what is the U.S. law enforcement community learned from the Israelis as, in terms of you know frontline defense against this kind of event? Well, well, keep in mind that we have not suffered a very catastrophic attack to, to this degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, Mike, you could yeah. uh, agree that yeah. we can't imagine how many have probably been prevented right. as a result of the good work of the FBI. So we've learned a lot from them, but obviously they're not going to reveal what they've learned because then they're going to be revealing their operation. But I'll point out, though, that Omar Mateen shot, I think, 49 people died mm -hmm. in, in that nightclub yeah. attack. So that's, that's as catastrophic. Mm -hmm. As this Agreed, attack, yeah. given the, the number killed, yeah. I mean this is this is different and strikes fear in a in a different way, yeah. but never because of the children who were murdered. Right. But nevertheless, yeah. that was a catastrophic attack. Yeah. Mike, uh, Michael, I have, a, I have a question. There, there's been recent blowback um, about military grade equipment being given and uh, to local law enforcement, right, for them to be able to prevent these kinds of attacks. Is that something that you think that blowback is unnecessary and unwarranted because local law enforcement need access to that kind of response equipment? What's your position there? So it depends upon what type of equipment you're talking about. You know, one of the things that um, the Army has developed in, over in Afghanistan and Iraq is the ability to disrupt a signal that's sent to a device, an improvised explosive device. They did that when they were traveling down the roads in Iraq and Afghanistan. The problem there, believe it or not, to utilize that in the United States, the Secret Service has that equipment, but a lot of local law enforcement do not because, believe it or not, the FCC, that there's a challenge in, in interrupting waves because the way you use it, yeah. it it's got to be coordinated, and so local don't necessarily have that ability. However, there is a lot of equipment that they do use, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, that's really deterrent effect, and what you really need is really good intelligence because you need to be proactive on this. And so here in New York City, NYPD, probably one of the best local intelligence shops in the nation, if not in the world. 
the question is how do you support that and how do you get that information that's actionable in real time we've had a very good run in this country and yes we have had attacks here but when you consider what's been going on in Europe we are relatively much much safer the question becomes how do you really continue to protect arenas like this when well, they decide to do this type of an attack right because again I just want to point out that and, and this is not a, a direct comparison but that the Manchester Arena and then it's attached to the Victoria train station mm -hmm. it holds about 21,000 people that's roughly the size of Madison Square Garden Madison right. Square Garden attached to Penn right. Station right. it's not unlike something that you would see here in the United States and it, at Manchester Arena they check they you can't take a backpack into an event like that you can't take bottles of water but nevertheless yeah. you have this suicide bomber that's standing out by the the box office there's no way to eliminate all of the vulnerabilities. It just isn't. You know, it's not, not about eliminating risk. It's about managing it. Mm -hmm. And it's about using resources in a very smart, safe way. But again, you know, it, it is really about the information that's coming from the well, So what, what's the next step the United States, U.S. authorities need to take on the intelligence front to improve our intelligence uh, gathering capabilities to prevent this kind of thing? What's not happening yeah. now that needs to happen? So you, you've seen things where the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the, I think probably one of the more effective groups in terms of sharing intelligence back and forth. That's not as been robust as it has been in the past. I think that we need to put more money in, in terms of the state's collection capabilities, in terms of the cities like New York, like L.A., Miami. But we also need to have a better opportunity to share this information on, an, on a daily, ongoing basis. New York City does it, but a lot of places in the nation don't. And that's one of the things that we should be, continue to examine. Intelligence is really key in this. Right, and that's been a problem on the whole of Europe as well, in terms of the intelligence, the information sharing between these nations. Yeah, we saw that in the Brussels attacks, right. when they hadn't shared a lot of the information. But, but let's also make this point, very important point. You can, there's no intelligence in the world that's going to say, stand on this corner at 3 o'clock because that's when the attack is going to happen. It just doesn't work like that. And so it's about surveillance, it's about following people, but that's about resources. It's incredibly expensive and time consuming to try to surveil one individual. Especially analysis, because someone may get a piece of information in LA, another one in New York, another one in Chicago. You need people to analyze that and then to bring it all together. When on the surveillance front, you could be following someone, someone could just be sitting there for years before they do right. anything. You're absolutely right. And you never know when they're actually going to. Yeah, and, and, and some of the attacks, like in, in uh, London and in, in Paris before in Cannes, you know, when you, when you have the guy getting in a truck, but so at what moment do you sit there and say, this guy is now radicalized and he's going to turn this vehicle into a weapon? Incredibly impossible to stop. But it, I, I do want to point out that, today, that, that, that this attack in Manchester was four years to the day after that British soldier, Lee Rigby, was hacked to death outside yeah. that, that, that army barracks in mm -hmm. South London by two extremists. So there's some timing here that's... They knew, usually don't pay attention to, to, to dates, though. They usually, the, the memorials or, or anniversaries are something they usually don't pay attention to. Michael, it was great to see you. Thank you so much for being here this morning, Michael Balboni.